Hi again, so I'm Greg Newman, CEO of Onyx Capital Group. Uh, today I want to talk about something quite close to my heart actually when it comes to trading and research and, and looking at the forward price. Uh, commonly we talk about supply and demand models as a way as the, lead, well, the leading way to predict the price and this conversation comes up again and again, it's what you see a lot all over the news and from agencies etc. Uh, but actually I'm going to talk today about why I don't think that's the best way. And this conversation came up as early as this morning, actually, um, from someone very reputable and experienced in the industry, and, and we had a great conversation about it. And being IP Week, so I'm just as I am, but I'll, I'll go on and talk about why I don't think this is ideal. So, first of all, what is a supply and demand model? Well, a lot of you will know it's just a, a forecast of balance using assumptions, trying to determine whether we're going to be in a surplus or a deficit of supply, and then you can therefore extrapolate, you know, a price curve. Is it going to go up or down? And it's really the leading cause or the leading foundation of what people use when they want to predict. And they generally say, or researchers say, you know, this is what we think, a supply or deficit of X, and therefore the price we think is going to average out here based on that. But immediately I'm going to talk about why I don't think this really holds up and it is the leading way to give yourself the best chance of, of forward looking at prices. So first of all, what's the issue? Well, the key factor when we're talking about assumptions is assumptions on demand growth. So usually it's based on economic factors, you know, GDP, these kind of things. But immediately you're getting into areas where it's not even talking about oil anymore. You're talking about population growth, you're talking about economic policies, etc. And ultimately, these are very, very hard to predict. So much so that, as everyone knows out there, you know, the 08 recession, you name it, it is impossible to predict. So when it comes to predicting demand growth, it's the same thing ultimately. Um, the other thing is when you do actually get price you know, increases and even decreases, things change immediately. You know, one or two dollar per barrel, maybe not, but five or six or ten dollar per barrel moves in the outright price. Suddenly that impacts the trade balances for, um, for governments. It will therefore impact, uh, you know, monetary policy from inflation, etc. But ultimately it's not even looking at when you do get a price increase, what about the increase in the uh, end user product? Because, you know, a huge increase in gasoline relative to crude on top of a crude increase will be hit a company or a country, sorry, more so than it would something else because of you know, a lot of the old demand coming from car uses, for instance. And it gets very messy to determine what a price increase actually does to the supply and demand models. So you know, what it comes down to is what I'm saying. Ultimately, they are consistently inaccurate. And I don't think anyone's going to point me to a prediction that's been sound and is consistently sound. And therefore, that's kind of the crux of the point initially. But the other thing is there's no real consideration for what moves the old price as well as the supply and demand. I think in general, there is too much emphasis just on what's happening to the physical supply and demand and therefore that should move the oil price. But as I'm sure everyone knows, or at least has an inkling, you know, that's not the only thing that drives the oil price. In fact, I would go as far as to say is it's not even the leading thing anymore, given how big the derivative market has got. So the first thing is, right, what else is there apart from supply and demand? Well, there's pricing, right? There's this basis idea. What you've got to trade, what you're actually trading, as in express your view with what you're actually trading. If you're trying to find a, or predict a price for the future price of oil, you've got to be clear that if you're looking at Brent, then that's actually the underlying North Sea market. It's not just the average price of oil in the world. It's crude oil in the North Sea. And with that comes a lot of a plethora of, it, of um, complexities. You know, I've mentioned a few here, but you know, the way that Chinese demand ebbs and flows for uh, Western crude, sweet sour economics, blending and demand, all this can really shift how the North Sea is priced, and that will have, then have knock-on effects on the outright price, much more than people seem to realize, and certainly more than just the supply and demand balance for the whole world, when we're talking about such a small region relative to the world. Uh, for WTI, it's exactly the same thing. We're talking about a landlocked crude that needs to be, you know, get to the exported market, it needs to go down pipelines, it needs uh, export capacity from ships, you name it, there's so many things that can go on. I mean, I've mentioned even VGO prices, it's getting quite in depth, but you know, the price of uh, vacuum gas solids into the secondary units in the US, you know, if that price varies too much in Europe, then they suddenly that will change the way they buy and sell crude. So it's all, it's all very, um, a lot of complexity going on is the ultimate point. So that's before we even get into the fact that speculation and open interest is a huge bearing on markets. And again, this is not just oil, but in oil in particular, you know, I've got a stat here, world crude production, such so as physical oil. Uh, the actual amount of oil or the volume traded on the futures contracts, if you add them up, you know, crude production itself or physical itself is an 8% of that. So it's a huge multiple. So you can imagine supply and demand, you know, slight increases and decreases with surpluses and deficits is almost can be in some cases nothing compared to the speculative open interest that can overwhelm that. Uh, to the extension where actually, just before I get to the second point, 
you know, when you have an imbalance of hedges versus speculators, this is something that's very interesting as well. Particularly in the US, they use the WTI to forward hedge. The share oil producers come in and say, right, I need to forward hedge all this production. Well, not everyone does that. Not everyone hedges 100%. So when you talk about what's actually moving the derivative, you need to know who's actually playing in that market. And you can't just assume all the buyers are hedging 100% and all the sellers are hedging 100%. It's just not like that. There's too many dynamics at play just to look at supply and demand and not factor these things in. And as I said in the second point, any under or over extension, as we're constantly, constantly uh, in a period of uh, overbought, oversold, um, and that comes from open interest and ultimately speculative bubbles that are very you know, ebbing and flowing, always being created and, and bursting all the time. So ultimately, what can you do about this? Well, we think, well, I think the best way to lead your kind of predictive power, especially if it's just on an annualized basis, when we're talking about you know, 10, 20, 30 years, don't get me wrong, you need some kind of model for that and you need a lot of assumptions and that might be required to forward hedge you know, quite a bit for a government or whatever it might be. But if it comes to looking on an annual basis, that's short term enough to look more at what's going on with the prompt and what's actually really going on and determining from there the long term impact. So the first thing would be prioritizing refinery economics. Like the refiners are the ones that actually buy the crude. So that should be the first time you look at, well, how is the crude market being affected by the people that are buying it? They've got the economics, which are not straightforward, but more straightforward to work out than supply and demand models, that's for sure. And you can look at all the individual product prices relative to crude, and that will shift you know, what crudes they want to buy. And again, if they want to buy more light versus heavy, then you can expect Brent versus Dubai to increase, that kind of thing. And that, in turn, will have knock-on effects and ultimately the outright price of oil. It's not as simple as saying there's a lot of demand, therefore Brent's going to go up. You have to embed kind of everything. So that would be the first thing. Generally, what's the refinery economic health or lack of health? Secondly, you have to have underlying analysis on the basis. When you're trading Brent or WTI, you've got to know what are the cash premiums, what's really going on with the BFOAT market in North Sea or the cash WTI when it comes to WTI. You need to understand the factors that influence that because as we saw with that huge dissipation not so long ago between WTI and Brent, there's a $24 discrepancy all because of the actual uh, complexities that were going on in Oklahoma, whereas you wouldn't initially think about that when you're just looking at supply and demand as a whole. And the final thing is, remember, there are always signals when there's speculative bubbles, when there's, uh, you know, an overextension either way. And I've put here, you know, physical premiums. You can compare region by region. You can compare, compare the benchmark region relative to areas around it. For instance, the North Sea, you can compare the Mediterranean, et cetera, et cetera. So those kind of things you can do. But ultimately, where can you find it? If it's not your expertise, well, you need a research reporting team that actually does do this and evaluates everything as a whole, not just the overall supply and demand, but also how that marries relative to the open interest, the speculative, the pricing, all as a whole. And that's what you can get with Onyx Insight, and that's why I'm so passionate about it, because I genuinely believe we've created a product that's a trader's assistant. It's built by traders for traders, with the reason being to be the best possible probability of success when it comes to predicting the oil price, but certainly a lot better, than what I believe, than supply and demand models. So thanks very much for listening, and please, again, like, comment, reshare, and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.